call the regular city commission and public hearing for Tuesday, September 12, 2017, yep. to order. And we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amy, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Foreman? Here. Commissioner Kuzak? Here. Commissioner Perry? Here. Commissioner Scott? Here. 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 Well, this is one of our annual things that we love the most, is the 2017 City of Pleasant Ridge Beautification Award. Yay! So, without further ado, yes. Commissioner Foreman. Yes. Allow me one moment to familiarize myself with the remote. Okay, it's working great. Huh? Uh, <laughs> technology. Well, 2017, and with another year, comes another crop of uh, wonderful homes for us to recognize tonight, and the homeowners that maintain those homes the way they do. Um, put these items down. First off, just a quick recap on the mission of this group. Well, it's basically to recognize neighbors whose homes enhance the beauty of our city. Very simple, although not quite so simple to actually do the work and keep the home looking the way it does. So that's what we're here to recognize tonight. Um, also, just a quick recap to introduce, it's in darkness now, but uh, <laughs> yes, if you don't mind, my fellow members of the Beautification Committee, uh, Sean Daniels, who's standing back there, uh, Kathy Gillis, <laughs> Kathy Gillis up here, um, David Laylaw, I don't believe he's able to make it quite yet. Uh, we can clap for him when he gets here. <laughs> Jennifer Kieber, right here. All right. Melinda Pipple. I don't She's at work. Okay. okay. We'll clap for her too we'll if she should come. <laughs> and finally, uh, Dan Troyter, right here. All right. All right. <laughs> Special thanks to Jan's husband, Tom, who took the wonderful pictures for us for this presentation tonight, and those pictures will also be emailed to the recipients of the awards. Yeah, Tom. Uh, just a quick recap here of what we do. Um, basically, we break the city into seven zones. There are seven members of the committee, so we randomly assign the zones each year. Each person picks some nominations that they would like to submit, and then the group meets a few times. We discuss those nominations and narrow them down to what this year is going to be four winners. So we have four homes to recognize tonight. Um, this will be led by Don. Oops, I skipped ahead. Of Sorry. Giving it away. I gave up the first one, but uh, Don's going to discuss those for us, and uh, then we'll wrap it up a little bit at the end. So we have. Some parting gifts that we will be handing out as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> no music, though. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Good evening, and on behalf of this committee, I am delighted to present this year's Beautification Award recipients. I'm sorry. Rotate a little this way. They can't. Oh. Thank you. Take this way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <Get up. laughs> Come. This is. Take the whole. Don't be photo shot. This. Come on up. Thank you. Come on up. Yeah, that's okay. 28 May. Tough room. So, <laughs> two stately lions flank the stone walkway and porch steps at 28 Maywood. The Cafe Ole exterior is accented with crisp white, emphasizing the architectural details. Well-groomed beds curve around the home's foundation and are filled with shaggy grasses, glossy hosta, flowering sedum, and a tidy boxwood hedge. Brightly colored annuals and a striking fuchsia hydrangea add just the right pop of contrast, and a small tree brings the landscape into balance with the home. Special attention also is given to the side views with a hosta bed covering around on the left and Pacassandra lining the driveway on the right. This impeccably renovated home is the work of James Riggio and Curtis Edgar. Next we have 52 Fairwood. 52 Fairwood is a real standout on the block. Topin White defines its cottage style charm, accented with a deep burgundy door featuring a unique personalized decoration. An inviting front porch patio is set with black iron table and two chairs, repeating the black iron of the stair rail. Elegant pots are filled to overflowing with a variety of annuals, including the deep burgundy of sweet potato vine. 
Raised beds on either side of the porch are filled with mature hydrangeas on the right and a low boxwood hedge to the left that is fronted by an abundance of small pink roses. White double begonias surround a small Japanese maple in the lawn and repeat the accent colors. And a flower-filled side window completes the home of Allison Lavoie. And, yeah, this is Mrs. Lavoie, Allison's mom. And special thanks, actually, to Jan Troyter for this wonderful verbiage that we're that I'm able to to share this evening. 106 Cambridge. There's a casual elegance to the home of Mark and Lori Bolock at 106 Cambridge. Stonework pillars are topped with spectacularly planted pots. Approaching the porch, a garden bench sits to the left, and a boxwood-lined pebbled concrete path leads to the driveway on the right. Brown shutters and crisp white trim are the perfect complement to the taupe clapboard siding, softened by foundation plantings of creamy lime pom-pom hydrangeas. At the far left, a nicely trimmed tree is surrounded by sedum and connected to the, tor the porch excuse me, by a line of shrub roses. A basket and crate arrangement on the porch and a flurry of flags add a touch of Americana to this Cape Cod style home. And I might add, if you have the opportunity to sneak in their backyard, because it too is amazing. <laughs> 106. Come on over. 106 Cambridge, Mark and Lori Bolock. So the talk of the neighborhood, imagine this. What is going on at number three Poplar Park? Hmm. Everyone was talking about the transformation. Every step of the way, as it played out on one of the most visible properties in Pleasant Ridge, numerous conversations swept the community when the old plantings were ripped out, a new stone ledge and front path were installed, and the entire brick building was painted a glistening white. Interesting, yes. After months of diligent work, it all came together, starting with a creamy ivory top coat and dark toned roof. A row of boxwoods and plumed grasses now outline the broad front patio. On the turf level, thoughtfully arranged plantings of varying textures include hosta, hydrangea, lamb's ear, feathery coreopsis, and a stilby punctuated with touches of purple, lav lavender, and Russian sage that echo the subtle shades of a nearby tricolor beach. Well-sized evergreens and purple-leafed hoikara define the woodward corner of the property. New homeowners Scott Lassley and Alex Guerrero tell us it's still a work in progress as they wait the arrival of custom replicas of Spanish Revival light fixtures to replace those currently on the facade. A unique bench that will be set left of the entrance, a large planter to go on the right, and more plantings along the drive and into the backyard. Nevertheless, the beautification, beautification committee felt this renovation already deserved its award, and it's a welcoming w entrance into our community. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have a special mention. Um, the beautification committee this isn't necessarily one of our included uh, areas, part of our assigned duties, but we felt it was absolutely necessary to discuss it. Um, so we couldn't let this one go by, this presentation this year, without mentioning it. Um, basically, it's the most significant beautification that really possibly the city has ever seen. And in such a short amount of time, it's made such a huge difference. Uh, so the reinvention and rehabilitation of Gainsborough Park has literally changed the landscape of Pleasant Ridge. Mm -hmm. Nice Park has now become a spectacular recreational oasis, enjoyed by residents of all ages, levels of ability, energy, and interest. Tots jump and climb without fear of skinned knees, <coughs> play hide and seek under the bridge, or scamper up to wave at the train engineer passing by. Mm -hmm. Older children spin on the giant ball, not spit, spin. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they don't spin. I that too. <laughs> climb a rock wall, kick a soccer ball, smack a baseball deep into the outfield, and the tennis and basketball courts are used more than ever. Gardeners have a sunny and attractive spot with accessible water. Awesome. To grow juicy tomatoes, crisp cucumbers, and bushels of zucchini. Our neighborhood dogs have a safe place to run and play, and entire families, including the dogs, 
can enjoy a stroll along the meandering path throughout the park from end to end. For many, the conversation pit by the shelter has proven to be a great spot to sit, relax, maybe read a book, and even host a uh, birthday party. Working on this project over its lifespan, it has become evident that it takes an entire community to create a truly incredible and inclusive park. First and foremost, we want to recognize the tireless contributions, insight, and enthusiasm of our Parks and Recreation Director, Scott Peterjack, who is not here tonight. Mm -hmm. Jim Brockman. Our assistant recreation director, Shawnee Stanford. With their guidance and personal input from countless residents who attended special community focus groups and commission meetings, we were able to capitalize on the expertise of the recreational design company Living Lab to customize a plan that met and even exceeded the expectations and collective desires of Pleasant Ridge residents. It would have all been just a nice idea were it not for our residents endorsing and supporting the vision by approving a special millage for the parks. And also for the generous donations provided through the expert fundraising efforts of the Pleasant Ridge Foundation. And as, well as, as well as many individual contributors. Furthermore, this group applauds the Pleasant Ridge City Commission for its unwavering support of the process, often accompanied by lively or extremely lively discussions, debates, and compromise. Yes. <laughs> so it worked out very well in the end. To everyone involved in every big and small way, congratulations and thank you for creating the new and improved Gainesville Park and for keeping the vision alive as we continue to make improvements there and at Four Ridge, the, our community center, to better meet the ever-evolving needs of our community. As you may have seen, the work is already underway back there. Possible mention next year. So look for that. Uh, next, I'd just like to summarize the quick tokens of our appreciation. You'll see that tile, that's what it looks like this year. It's made by a potter in Royal Oak who does a fantastic job. Each one is handmade each year. And uh, again, we'll email the photo to each person who uh, has had one taken to their home. So, everyone, if you wouldn't mind one last time, put your hands together for all of the Mayor, if I could add one quick thing. Yeah. Um, um, nobody's left the room. Oh. Uh, uh, we almost had them. <laughs> On the subject of Gainesville yes. Park, uh, the first event that we're having in the park since it's been redone is the Hayride uh, on October 22nd. It's going to start at 3 o'clock. We're going to do a grand reopening, small ceremony event beforehand, and then the Hayride will start at 3.30. So if you can make it out at 3 o'clock, it'd be great. Looking forward to uh, rechristening the park. Will it be big scissors? I think we may find some okay. big scissors. <laughs> <laughs> Excited. Well, that was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Beautiful. Nice way to start. I think we should do that just about every other month. <laughs> <laughs> Next month we get to celebrate the uh, our young baseball champions. So, no, right. Right. so we always have a good. Those are good times. So let's see. November. Oh, it's election time, isn't it? Um, all right, next item on the agenda is public discussion items not on the agenda. If you have something to bring forward, I, give I do address and... I will. Oh, now. Oh, no. <laughs> Lock that door. <laughs> Thank you. Don't want to hear this. It'll rain on your they face. Almost, they almost oh, ran over the new superintendent. Oh, no. oh, God. Oh, oh, Danya, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's <laughs> Okay. So my name is Lauren Howard and I live at 22 Oakland Park. I used to live at 53 Fairwood and before that my husband lived on Woodward Heights in an illegal apartment. <laughs> um, I'm here because I listened with dismay to last month's meeting. Respectfully to you all, I do not find the presence of fecal matter and duck feces in the pool to be amusing. The health department inspected our pool, Pleasant Ridge Pool, the week of October 22nd, and they found us to be in violation of certain health rules. And the one that the inspector, they found us not to be in compliance. The one that she pointed out in her report was that we failed to keep our pool deck in a clean and sanitary condition. And she observed duck feces on the side of the pool. Now, I happened to be there that day. She 
inspected the pool during the time that the class I was taking was going on. And I must say, I, I saw more feces than she did, but she pointed out, the inspector pointed out two areas where there was fecal matter on the side of the pool. I can tell you from taking a class on Tuesdays and Thursdays and sometimes Saturday that I have observed duck feces in the pool and on the pool deck many times, and I have observed it in the same places on Thursday that I saw it on Tuesday. Now, after the health department lady inspector had left the pool deck that day, she was, I believe, inside the uh, four ridge, there were uh, pool staff who had come out and they came out with bottles and brooms and various things that looked as if they'd been instructed to clean up the fecal matter. But to my observation, they had not been trained properly to do it. And in fact, when they were cleaning up the fecal matter, it was their way of doing it kind of pushed it back into the pool. Now I did a little research on this and it turns out that ducks, chicks, and reptiles are most likely to carry salmonella. And I looked up salmonella. And salmonella is a type of food poisoning that affects, in particular, young children and the elderly. I, we don't say elderly anymore. Apparently it's older adults now, but speaking as one, what can I say? It also affects, can affect very negatively people with compromised immune systems. Now I can't tell who has a compromised immune system from being at the pool, but I can tell we have a lot of very young children and older people at the pool. So those individuals can become seriously ill from this. It's, it's not really uh, a small matter. that if, if somebody gets this, it can be very serious for them. The health inspector directed in her report that the pool, the city, take measures to, quote, remove and eliminate the ducks from the pool and the pool enclosure while meeting state and local wildlife laws. Now, from my observations, and I was at the pool, as I mentioned, two or three times a week from June till August, and I did not observe any measures being taken, and certainly none after the inspector was there in August. And I know from reading the mayor's post on Facebook that he was there on the last day, and the ducks were also. Uh, to say that nothing can be done about the ducks because of the Federal Migratory Bird Act is really not the case. First of all, the Federal Migratory Bird Act prevents us from killing the ducks. And as mad as I would get about this this summer, I never once suggested killing the ducks, and I never heard anyone say we need to shoot the ducks. The health department, I don't see how they would tell us to remove and eliminate the ducks from the pool and the pool enclosure if it wasn't possible to be done. It, it doesn't make sense to me that they would say we need to remove the ducks from the pool enclosure if there was a federal law that prevented us from removing the ducks from the pool enclosure. When you go online, you see pools have had these problems and that there are various ways that pools address it. I don't think that it was addressed. I think we sort of encouraged the ducks to be there, but I, I will just let that lie. Because the pool, the ducks were there from the time the pool opened to the time the pool closed. And I don't, I did not see any attempt to get rid of the ducks. But the reason I'm here is because, as I said, I watched last month's meeting uh, that was streaming, and I was thinking that now that the pool is closed, it might be a good IT, uh, idea to take the winter to think about this and to accomplish not bringing in ducks next year, not encourage them to make a home in the pool, and that if the rec staff, if our staff can't do it, there are licensed professionals who can and that the city should hire them. Because I see that the Oakland County Health Department has told us to do this and we should be doing it. So um, that's all I have to say. If you have any questions about my uh, statement, I'd be glad to answer them. Otherwise, that's that's all. I, I just wanted to say, up to the to the last part, I think that there is no doubt that everybody wants to make sure that there aren't ducks next year, yes. if at all possible. I mean, that's that goes without saying. We don't. Oh, good. We don't. We don't look advertise the ducks as one of the reasons you should come to Pleasant Ridge because you can swim with ducks. Um, but it is an issue of trying to figure, trying to catch them when they first, before they lay eggs, and trying to make sure that 
this time it was it was later in the year when they came and it was later in the year when we filled the pool because of the surface you know the the mar site had been had to be redone the whole surface of the pool and so everything got pushed back but i know this was not something that scott or anybody else took pleasure in and having these ducks um so i think the question was after they were there the idea of removing them and I and I don't know you know I I know what was told to me but I don't know what well, I, you learned and, and I only what know possibilities my, there right. are um, right. but certainly we're going to try everything we can to make sure the ducks don't find their way yeah. to Pleasant Ridge next summer do you have a copy of the inspection report by no, any I chance were you ever given that did no. that go to the do you have a copy Jim did anybody give you oh okay so you can provide it to the City Commission. Anyway, Mayor, thank you very much for listening to me. The oh. the inspection I heard I you know, yeah, no, oh, I, I might have said, no, it was August. 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 I'm August. sorry, I probably that misspoke. That was the, <laughs> the report is not dated, at least I printed it off, and it said one of two pages, but the second page was blank, and it also, I think, cut off the date. But since I was there that day, I believe it was August 22nd. It was at least the week of August 22nd. I'm sorry if I said October. No problem. Please. <laughs> Get old, your goes. Oops. All right. Yeah. Anything yeah. else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. I'm Eric Zucker, 42 Kensington. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking. Um, as you probably already know, because I know I've been tossed emails back and forth uh, with Kurt and Jim on uh, what was going on with the at t installing of the wiring. Um, I've just got to say that the whole thing, I was quite <sighs> disappointed the way the city treated my household and my family um, and the way they treated us residents. I can go on to the story if you want to. Um, I came home to find that somebody had come into my backyard, left the gate unlocked. The next door neighbors had an incident like this. Their dog escaped and died running into the street. Um, find garbage in my front yard, garbage in my backyard. I found a wire the length, the width of my whole yard laying there, pieces of metal, and a burnt cigarette burnt into dry leaves in my backyard. I contacted the police. It took them uh, probably about 45 minutes to get to my house, and the guy didn't knock on my door, the police officer, he walked into my house. And when I confronted him about why you're walking in my house, he says, you called me, what do you want? Uh, he was uh, not very nice. And then he said they have the right to come into my backyard and do what they need. He says they have at and I said, but that's not at and There is no labeling, there is no ID, there's nothing. You can't prove that's at t He didn't care, he was badgering me. And let me quote, as he's standing in my house, looking at me and my wife, he says, well, you people. I don't know what you people really means. Is that a derogatory term? Um, but he referred to my wife and I as you people. And at that point, when I asked him to go in the backyard to inspect what damage was done or anything else was there, he refused. Uh, the police chief did come by on Saturday because he was out of town for that week. Um, I wouldn't say he formally apologized, but he backpedaled on some of the instances, told me that they were coming into the backyard, and again, they were there without any ID on their truck, without any ID that they're wearing. I had a wire in my backyard and all the trash and everything for three weeks. I contacted at t I filed a report, and I talked to Jim. I got a quicker response from at t and the state of Michigan than I did from you, Jim. You never called me back. He never asked for my phone number when I talked to you extensively. Um, that was not right. Um, that's all I can say. I can go on and on about this. Um, they labeled themselves as utility. If they're actual utility and there's a down wire, then it's an emergency. And if they're a utility, they should act like utility. They shouldn't um, trash and uh, do all the other things they've done. Not only that, but the liability that you exposed my family and my household to, if somebody falls, they go to my insurance company, and you can't deny that. I have talked to the councilman at Oak Park, who's a lawyer. I've contacted an insurance company uh, that deals with nonprofit and municipalities. Um, I also contacted my PA, who is a private assessor, who deals with 
um, fighting insurance companies. And yes, if that person falls off the ladder, if that person catches everything on fire, the first person they come to is my insurance company. My insurance company then has to sue everybody else. And since we still don't know who these people are to this day, who are we going to sue? I know you guys couldn't get a hold of AT&T. AT&T gives you the runaround. I got my thing fixed in my house. You guys still haven't. What's going on? And you allowed, you forced the police to push me around and my family around to allow somebody that we don't know who they are, because they're still not AT&T. They're a subcontractor or a subcontractor. We don't know how much liability insurance or anything else they have to come into my backyard. Now my next door neighbors, they're standing on the garage doing a dance, putting up the wires. When I'm doing my jog, there are still wires down that are lengths from pole to pole over by the beautiful garden that you showed over there and uh, along the uh, dirt that uh, stone trail there. I run, I ran over 130 miles in the city in the last seven weeks and they didn't trash any other street worse than they trashed Kensington. There was trash all over the place. And uh, I don't want to go on and on other than when you have a utility wire down and you cut somebody's utility down, I work for I service HUD, I service the state of Michigan, I service Oakland County. And when you have a down wire like that, um, the place is deemed uninhabitable, okay? You can't charge rent when there's no utilities going to it. And they classify themselves as utility, they should act to utility. And when I call up the city and when I call up the police, I expect them to represent me and I don't expect them to represent AT&T. AT&T is a multi-billion dollar company. We are not. We are the residents here. You're supposed to represent me. Um, I remember a day living here because I've lived here over a quarter of a century and I grew up in walking distance of my house for all my over half a century that I'm alive. And I remember the day that uh, city, the Pleasant Ridge fought cable because they said my cable or nobody else's cable. We said no, nobody tells us that. And we were one of the first municipalities to have competition with cable. I also remember them fighting for the freeway. Who did they fight there? It was a strong fight. We're not gonna fight anymore. We're just gonna let a multi-billion dollar company walk in our backyards, trash them. There's still wires hanging all over the place and everything. It's uncalled for and it's embarrassing. I brag about our city. I brag about everybody in our city and our, our council. I brag about our, our operations. I brag about everything, but I can't brag about this. And I've consulted other cities and other people and um, it's just not right. It's not right. Um, also, I don't know, I sent you the email restating the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to jurisdiction, therefore, are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside. No state shall make an, or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Um, I can also quote you what law enforcement is, and it's supposed to protect the duties of police officers known as law enforcement, protecting people and property. They patrol the areas that are assigned. Um, they're supposed to protect the public. They're not supposed to represent AT&T. Um, it's, it's just was wrong. It was wrong at all levels. And as I asked before, I hope you have a big umbrella on the city because your insurance umbrella has to, if that caught on fire, the wire that was laying in my backyard was one foot away from a propane tank. Are you ready for multi, multi-million dollars of lawsuits? Um, it was wrong, and it was wrong for the city never to contact me about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any? Mayor, if I could just, um, Jim, as far as uh, liabilities, um, Mr. Zucker just mentioned the liability to the city. Um, could you or um, Greg discuss as far as what is our liabilities as a municipality? That's a question for Greg. Greg, do you mind? Hey, Greg. Eric, how are you? Doing great, thanks. How are you? I thought that was you. It was me. <laughs> Mr. Zucker uh, worked with his brother at a bagel shop in Waterford that I visited every morning for years, years, yeah. 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 for years. So, um, the activities done by a utility or their subcontractors are done pursuant to an easement. 
either a written document or a prescriptive easement. And Michigan law provides that once one utility has an easement, any of them can use it for that purpose. So it's really not a matter of city law or city ordinance. We don't have anything that addresses that because it's a matter of private property rights. Um, you're given that if there was some kind of a uh, incident or some kind of damage, then you know the subcontractor would be responsible. AT and T, as their principal, could be responsible. Um, but the city, it's not an area that the city regulates. It's not an area that the city really can regulate, except perhaps in a limited way that I spoke with Jim about earlier today. So there is really no liability to the city in that kind of case. So, you know, our insurance coverage really doesn't matter. Now, I'm not minimizing what mm -hmm. went on. It was obviously wrong. Um, but there are limited things that the city can do. I understand that AT&T was contacted, but the response was uh, not very helpful with regard to that. Um, depending on the circumstances, there might be the opportunity to complain to the state regulatory agencies, but there is really, unfortunately, not a lot the city can do. Now, do you want me to get into what we talked about, Jim, before? Sure. Yeah. Um, the issue really is, the one issue that I think the city can take some action on is people showing up without any kind of uh, identification, without any kind of introduction. And I do think that's something that we might be able to uh, address by adopting an ordinance that would require at least some kind of advance notice possibly and certainly that anybody that is operating on behalf of a utility company or their subcontractor carry proper identification and be required to show it upon request to the resident. Um, to have somebody show up, yeah, I wouldn't like it either. If somebody showed up at my property and started tearing things up and leaving it in a trashed condition, that's, you know, that's awful business practice and certainly it's very disturbing as a homeowner and I can certainly appreciate that. So from the law enforcement end and making sure that people actually have authority to be on property, I think we can do something. And if that's the direction of the commission, working with Jim and the staff, we could bring something back for you, determine exactly what we can do and what we can't do, and then bring something back to you at the next meeting. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. The state of Michigan doesn't require uh, people in easements to wear identification. You know, various utility companies do have requirements for their personnel, whether that's a matter of state regulation or the utility practice or how that's regulated, I can't tell you. I'd have to take a look at that. Okay. That's one of the things that we would look at. Okay. I know many utility companies do. I mean, they are in marked trucks. They have um, proper identification, they may have uniforms, but my understanding is a lot of utility companies now are subcontracting this work out, and with a subcontractor, you don't really know what you get at that point. And that may be, I don't know what happened here, but that may be what happened. Is it possible, Brett, is it possible that you can help the city uh, adopt a proper protocol and procedures going forward on this matter? Yeah, that's, gonna, that's what I we suggested. Because we, we don't have anything formal. If the, commission, right. we will, we will. if the commission gives us the go-ahead, we would certainly be happy to work with Jim to do that. I think we'd like to see that. Anything? Any motion for that? Other business? Thanks. 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 I put together, uh, I have an idea uh, for a music festival in our parks. Gainesboro Park was, is the preferred location um, on the north end, uh, just south of the pole building um, at the DPW yard. Uh, it's a music festival featuring women uh, female fronted acts and singer songwriters that uh, my wife had put together years ago. Um, we've been residents for quite some time, and we we'd always been in a club to have the the festival, and we'd always talked about wanting to eventually move it to Pleasant Ridge to the park. 
you like me to speak for a minute? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the Motor City Songbirds would be seeing its fifth year. This is a maturing festival that features incredible female talent from around the region. It also is a significant fundraiser for important groups that many of us in this room support for Fern Care this year, as well as WDET. This festival is, there's already a lot of enthusiasm for this year's iteration, a lot of excitement. It will draw some um, vibrant, creative, multi-generational uh, neighbors to the Pleasant Ridge area. I should introduce myself before I presume to speak to you. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. My name is Bridget Deegan Krause. I'm your neighbor. I live at 521 West Oak Ridge. I could throw a stone to Pleasant Ridge, but serve um, um, as a friend to Craig, and I'm glad to be able to speak to you here tonight. But knowing, too, that this is... Um, this is a festival that would honor a longtime resident of Pleasant Ridge, Julie Sias, mm -hmm. who was a great lover of music and a great neighbor to so many of us, and a social worker to add to that, and someone who brought community together in lots of different ways. I don't know what else I need to say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm standing at Craig's side today. This is a gentleman bereaved, um, but also community that is also in the process of still saying goodbye and still um, with a broken heart saying goodbye to Julie. But this would be a wonderful way and an evening with, that began with celebration um, in terms of uh, this meeting, a wonderful way to be able to bring this forward. I know one of the conversations that the uh, your leadership team needs to have is that we're fast tracking this. This would be coming on very quickly. The thing I'd like to highlight is because it's a maturing festival, there's a team of people behind this. This would come together well. It would be exceedingly well run, and it's going to be a fairly high-profile event for this community. And it would be the beginning, perhaps, of future events as well. I know there's even talk of creating a scholarship out of this event at some point, and um, it'd be something that Pleasant Ridge could be tremendously proud of mm -hmm. should it come together. Just, I thought I'd ask a question. Um, Bridget, thank you. Craig, thank you. Sure. Um, I've heard about the festival over the years. Mary's been there. She said it's awesome. Julie put on a great show. She put this together. It's a wonderful event. Um, my question is, when would you be thinking that this would want? When would you want this to happen? I would like September 30th. It's only a few weeks away. Um, I have everything put together except for your approval. <laughs> it's all ready to go. It's, it, it can be self-contained if necessary. I'm guessing so, we can't transact anything tonight or whatever. No, no, no. I can ask Jim but questions, you, too. But you did start to talk with Jim. And yes, and yes. Right, I, there's going to be there will more be discussions. Meetings. Yeah. Yes. So the, the discussion is being <laughs> and there is okay. some hope, right? <laughs> it's going to be tough. I know, no, I know. This is not something that's that's easy to just snap your fingers and all of a sudden say, um, it's good. I mean, we have to figure out, we have to check availability and, and just kind of get an idea of what the logistics and everything are too. And I know that that will be... Does it have to be September 30th? I mean, this is really late to be bringing this to us for the first time. Right. Well, if I'm kind of afraid if we go any later, weather won't cooperate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's primarily <clears throat> from where I said more than willing to entertain something like this, but asking coming here and asking us to, to entertain it in two weeks is I, I don't know. We've got a lot of questions we have to get answered. So I understand. And our recreation director is out of town this week, so we're going to have to get that uh, sit down early next week. If, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think we're all. I don't want to speak for the commission, but you know, certainly from a staff perspective, we're happy to try to make this work. But we've got a, but there's a lot of some some. I don't even know what the hurdles are. At this point. <laughs> that was be my question. What are the known barriers at this point? I mean, how many legal issues? Or a thousand people? Right. I have to look into. You know, yeah. does this require yeah. formal yeah. city commission action to allow um, for use of parks? So. Uh, I don't even know what the questions are at this point. So, um, whatever you have prepared or ready in terms of your plan, you know the outline for the event. Um, get that to me ASAP tonight. Sure. Send it to me. Um, and we'll see what we can do. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I would just I would just add to uh, and I really appreciate um, Craig and Bridget coming out tonight and um, I know everybody in this a lot of people in this room you know um, feel the pain that your family has um, <laughs> gone through over the last year I don't think there is a uh, uh, event that is more perfect to honor your wife than this event. Something that she um, created and the continuation of that would be a great um, honor for her legacy. And I know from my perspective, and I'm, same thing, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I think um, between the city as an entity and the volunteers that loved and adored your wife and your expertise and your um, ability to put something like this together, I, I would like to see this happen. Um, I think um, having the conversation with Jim tonight is important, is vital, um, but, and I would just put the call out, and so I wanted to speak to it. If there are things that need to be done in the city on a volunteer basis, to prep or do whatever, or to staff or to work. Um, I'd like Jim and staff to know that I'm fully confident that if you ask 100 people tomorrow to come out and make this happen, they would make this happen. So um, I understand logistical difficulties of this, but I would just like to say that um, I think it is possible and I, w I personally would love to see this happen. So. Yeah, I know, it's a bad week, Scott being out of town. Um, wait till you get to the recreation, my liaison report. It's <laughs> difficult with Scott not being here to do the, rec the liaison report. It would be impossible for Scott not to be here and, and pull something like this off. Um, however, Jim is incredibly um, adept at his job, and Shawnee, you know, um, she's a rock star too, so. I just think the stars are aligned to make this happen, and I would just really hope that um, with a lot of hard work and you know the contributions that you're obviously willing to make that we can make this happen. So thank you for coming out tonight, and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Um, are there any other issues? I have a quick one, please. I'll be quick. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Wall from 3 Oxford. I just wanted to talk about, last time we talked about the foundation um, putting together an event in October, we have nailed that down. It's gonna be Wednesday, October 18th um, at seven o'clock for about an hour and a half. Um, is something wrong with that date? No, no. Okay. <laughs> like, did I miss a game or something? Like we always try to like pick something that people can show up for. Um, basically the format's gonna be telling people what the foundation is about. And another thing we're going to do that I'm excited about is get people's, feed <laughs> get people's feedback about what they'd like to see the foundation do, maybe some projects that are near and dear to people that they would like to see the funding go for. And we would like people to, you know, we're going to have like little break off groups about the different um, opportunities to volunteer in different areas for the foundation and um, try to put people in with that and answer questions and also have it be fun. There'll, well, there'll be um, great. some hors d'oeuvres and some potential adult beverages. <laughs> Where's it going to be? It's going to be, I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> it's going to be at the rec, um, at the rec center, and we're going to be having it at the new, um, the new area that we're doing right now, the whole back area. So we're going to showcase our latest project, which is why we chose to have it. It's no accident. <laughs> um, so it should be probably about 75% done. So you can see where our money has gone from the, um, the auction this year and all the great things it does. And you know how, of course, you talked about Gainesboro Park, how we kick-started uh, Gainesboro Park with the toddler area. We paid for that. Um, so we just want to come and, uh, and we want you to come and have a good time and learn more and um, and get involved. And you know, it'll be a good a good situation for everybody hopefully. I, mean, I think I missed it. What time did you say? It seven o'clock. Yep. Seven o'clock. If you did it at five in the morning you can use the fox and talk about how you Right? You can like you can right? watch yeah. me do it and then I pretend to work out. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? So we're very excited. That's a great, so, that's a great idea. I'm good. Yeah, we want. Yeah, we want people. So we want to educate people, but we also want people's feedback. And I think the more people know, the better off everybody is. 
get how, people engaged. How are you going to get the word out about it? Okay, so we are going to be sending out a mailer. Okay. We're going to be posting on Facebook probably tomorrow. Okay. So this is our, like, this is the, the crack open, uh, yeah. you know, situation Richard, tonight. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that? Ridger. Oh, the Ridger, of course. Where Ridger, would we be without the Ridger? Well, there you go. Yes. <laughs> it, should, it should be out just in time. Yes. So October 18th. Okay. Yep. That's a Wednesday. Okay. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Going to the I know. <laughs> it's going to be a busy fall. It is. Um, Thank are there you guys. Any, anyone else for public discussions? One, one thing I'd like to add here. Mm -hmm. On the um, a final kind of coda on the AT&T thing. Yes. Um, we did contact the state regulatory agency and um, the comment was about how Pleasant Ridge used to do things with the cable. Mm -hmm. Well, we used to have more ability to until the state rewrote all the laws mm -hmm. and took all the cable regulatory power issues away. away from us. So now we have to work through the state. <clears throat> so I don't want it there to be a sense necessarily of, of my agreement with those comments or that, uh, that from the city's standpoint that we find them to be completely up. accurate. Uh, I'm not going to argue here. but. Um, we did contact the state. We did file a complaint with the state. I talked extensively with probably three different departments at the state about this. And you know, in terms of the the contractors making a mess on the property, yes, that's a problem. But it's not something that the city we we could we can't even really file a complaint on behalf of residents. They have to contact the state. The the, the state wouldn't take our complaints about that, even though we tried to facilitate it. So every resident has to contact the state, and AT and T will then address it. Um, this is the Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission, and actually we ended up with the Department of uh, Energy, because hmm. that's where telecommunications is housed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's there's utilities, there's MPSC for Public Service Commission, and then there's energy. Energy handles telecommunications. Cable um, is handled through MPSC. So we ended up with energy, got a better response, and flipped it. And then something there. So, um, we're never going to resolve this, I think, with this resident to, to satisfaction, but uh, we have been working on this, and Greg and I have been talking about it, so that's all I wanted to add on that. That's great. And if we look toward an ordinance, maybe that can mm -hmm. help us a little bit next time. That's mm -hmm. what we do. And, you know, we've yeah. never run in, we haven't run into a situation mm -hmm. where, as talking to AT&T, the, all of their contractors are supposed to provide, provide notification and identification beforehand. We learned that through this process. One of their contractors did do that. Mm -hmm. They had other subcontractors okay. working for them who did not. So we've learned that. Um, and so that, you know, we've had other utilities, obviously, who work in the backyard and the easements. They have to maintain it. And we've, uh, we have never had a problem like this with any of those contractors. So, you know, we've learned some things. And uh, Greg and I have been talking about how to address this going forward because, you know, we don't like unidentified people going in our residents' backyards either. So we're going to see what we can do on that end of it so that at least they provide notice, provide proper notice identification all those things. Well, one of our, just, just for information, one of our residents who worked, one of our neighbors who worked for AT&T for 40 years said he spoke to the guys that were working, and they were even working on the weekends, but they were working free because they were so far behind, mm -hmm. and they were being paid minimum wage with very little, if any, training from Frank. And so this was... Unfortunately, this is how we subcontractors and subcontractors. And, and obviously, AT and T does, doesn't seem to care about who they're subcontracting or. That's correct. And so, because because they're conducting their their business poorly, um, the chief and I have talked about this. And if any other residents have this issue, if you have this issue going forward, uh, the police are going to throw them off the property now at this point until they provide notification. Certainly, uh, identification. Yeah. Yeah. Identification, notification, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. If they don't have that, if they can't prove right. that they've provided that kind of notification, we're going to throw them out now until they do. Because, mm -hmm. you know, at and not really willing to work with us on this. Right. So we'll use, we'll use whatever leverage we have um, to, to do what we can on this, to at least try to get them to go about their business. So talking to at and I don't know if I just mentioned this or not, but their, their agreement with their subcontractors is that they do notify and identify. And we're doing that. Mm -hmm. Jim, it sounds like this is a pretty widespread effort, not just limited to a few houses in town. Right, and again, because as Greg mentioned, it because it's a uh, private easement, and the city 
isn't involved in that process, we don't know. They did not. They never contacted us. They never informed us beforehand. We just started getting calls one day, and that was the first time we found out about it because nothing was ever contacted us. So I don't know the extent of where they're working. I know there was the mayor informed me they're down in the Ferndale now. Yeah. And it worked most of the east side. There haven't been any west side calls yet, so I don't know if it's coming on this side of town, but uh, um, I don't know. Mr. Zucker's was probably not the only call that you received no. about mm -hmm. the mess. It was, was not. Such? It was not. Well, we, we learn from these things, so we'll see. All right, no other items, so let's move on to the next item it's governmental reports i think we have the chief of police and that's probably it no, 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 no. <laughs> you're on i too will start with the at&t um thing i just have a few things <clears throat> like the city man excuse my voice it's going today um like the city manager stated we started receiving calls when the work started being done and it was wide scale, it was the entire east side. I myself went to 10 or 15 calls about people, them working in the yards, breaking off branches rather than cutting them, dropping them down, and the people were concerned about their flowers and things like that. When I went out and spoke with that group, um, <clears throat> they promised, and I went back and followed up, and it was on Fairwood, one of your neighbors, I believe, um, and they cleaned up, spoke with them, they were polite, the resident said they they were polite it was just she was just concerned about how they were going about their business there were different vendors working in town one of the companies um, prior to starting work hung door hangers on people's doors advising them that they're going to be there if they had dogs lock them up put them away or do whatever did we get complaints about gates being left open yes not everybody was as thorough but i don't think it was the company that we received a copy of the flyer from and a phone number for a manager who answered the phone and was concerned about what they were doing and promised that he would let all his employees know about the behavior and the type of work that we expect. Now, there were other vendors. Um, I went to the call, I believe, Mr. Zucker, you're the one that called about the guy in the garage, your neighbor's garage. Uh, no, I didn't call them. They okay. had, that neighbor called themselves. Well, when, when I got there, there was nobody on the garage, and um, they were putting stuff away and cleaning up in the yard. I didn't observe any damage to the garage or anything, and the person they called didn't stay for us to um, talk with. Um, as far as the officer that came to your house, I was out of town, but he called me right after he left your house and explained to me a little different version of the events. Um, he said he had a call there. He had to come from an accident because there was a guy on vacation. He was the only officer on that night at that particular time. And it took him, it did take him a while. I don't know if it was 45 minutes, I'd have to look. I'll, I'll believe what you say. Um, but he said he knocked and, and said police were there, nobody answered. Well, the, was, I'm just saying what he. I was two feet away. What he told me. He said the doorbell didn't ring, so he just walked so in. So he said that he did enter and then have a conversation with you. He, if nobody answered, no, no, just if nobody, if we get called to a house and we don't know the nature of it, we have to investigate, make sure there's no wrongdoing or whatever too. I'm not saying that this was the case or what he did in this instance was right, but he's an experienced veteran officer and. The city manager and I will vouch that none of our officers would most likely talk or act like that. And if they did, then I will have a conversation with him. Okay? Um, and <clears throat> I don't know if somebody's impersonating the chief of police because you said that I went out and I talked to you. Um, I never came okay. out. Okay, there was another officer on Saturday about 4 30. Okay. So it's a senior officer. Because I was out of town. Right. So I just want to clear up that I didn't talk to you, no, and then I didn't receive any phone call from you to address this. And if you want to no, come and talk to me, no, right. then we'll I'll okay, happily yeah. meet with you and we'll discuss it. Okay? Because uh, you're the officer lied. I mean, I got witnesses to what he said and okay. what he didn't say. All right. And, uh, I'm just saying it, how it, it was related to me on the phone. Yeah, it wasn't. No, I didn't talk to you then because okay. I'm like, you're not the chief. Mm -hmm. I know there's a new chief, okay, so I'm, not, I'm not right. aware of the new okay. sheriff yeah. in town. And that that's all I had to say about that. Um. I really didn't have anything else until this morning when we came in and uh, it, you saw them on Facebook, I saw a little bit that we had a series of um, larceny from vehicles where windows were broken. Actually we had 11 of them. 
Um, and these weren't cars parked on the street. I know I always say set your alarm and lock your doors. That might be bad advice because if they can open the door and get in, then they wouldn't break your window. But today they broke a bunch of windows. They used some sort of center punch device to break and then, but the odd thing was a lot of them, nothing was taken, nothing. Where there were valuables and change and money and prescription drugs inside, nothing was taken. I don't know if they got scared off or whatever, but there were items stolen or whatever. Um, we, I had officers on foot. I saw that they said, thought the state police were out there. It wasn't, it was two other Pleasant Ridge officers that went, walked on foot on every block on the west side looking for more damage. Um, checking for security cameras or ring or nest doorbells so we could obtain some video maybe and because right now we don't have any suspects no good fingerprint evidence nothing like that so um, if you see something suspicious call um, nobody some of the cars I went out I rode some of them this morning um, were parked right next to motion lights no car alarms went off um, the officers that worked midnights last night are here again tonight, and they said it was quiet throughout. No other cities got hit. There were no car alarms. There were anything. I checked the mileage. They were out driving around. So, because um, we do that, <laughs> we make sure they're out driving around every night. So, um, lock your cars, more motion lights. We got to try to make it hard for them to deter um, the criminal activity. But we did have 11 where most of the windows got broken out. Some, a couple windows got broken out. Some items are stolen, but like I said, not a lot. So if anybody has video that they're able to share and um, give to us, we'd be more than happy to take it so we could try to clear it up. The video you're looking for is Oxford and Hanover? There is Norwich, um, Hanover, the entire block. Um, Oxford, obviously from Woodward too to Ridge and Cambridge there. Besides that sound so bad. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Finally we're gonna get to it. We promised after all this time. <laughs> all right. The next item on the agenda is City Commission Liaison Reports and we'll start with Commissioner Foreman and Ferndale Public School. Yes, and here uh, this evening we have Donya Bazzi, our new superintendent, and she's with us tonight to tell us a little bit about what's going on in Ferndale Schools after she kind of introduces herself to the community a bit. This will be the first time we've met her. Thank you. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Rather fresh air. Who doesn't like a clap? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for the for the very warm welcome. I, I appreciate it very much. Um, I'm just, if I may approach you, I'm just going to hand out, there's three for that Thank way, you. just a little bit of, of an update. Um, first, uh, Mayor Metzger, mem members of the commission, city manager, city clerk, and members of the community, thank you for having me out this evening. Um, I am the new superintendent of Ferndale Public Schools. I started on July 1st. Uh, my educational journey started on the east side of the state. Uh, I, I went to Wayne Memorial High School and then went to U of M Dearborn and then did my doctoral studies at Wayne State University. Uh, I started to move to the west side uh, as my career progressed. Uh, most recently, I was the superintendent of Galesburg Augusta Community Schools, a rural town right in between Battle Creek and, and Kalamazoo. Um, I'm used to serving very unique and, and diverse communities that face challenges that, that many school districts face. Um, but in each of my experiences, we've, we've been able to overcome those challenges and, and provide the very best for our students, something I'm very proud of. I come from a family of educators. Uh, many of my, my family are teachers. Um, my sister went from being a teacher to a lawyer. I don't know why she made that jump, but you know, to, I guess uh, as long as everyone finds their own educational journey, I, I suppose, is, is the important thing. Uh, one thing that I'm telling you is I'm, I'm committed to all kids and providing them, like I said, uh, with a personal experience uh, with an exceptional result. At Galesburg Augusta, one of the things I prided myself is I knew the kids one-on-one. -on -one. 
I often mentored those who were struggling uh, to be able to help them uh, through their educational journey. I will tell you the, the key to my happiness, the key to my success has been my education. And so I will continue to be an advocate for public education and for the citizens that I serve in, in Pleasant Ridge as well as the other areas that we serve within Ferndale Public Schools. I have an open door policy for, for anybody and, and welcome you to, to be a part of the school district in any way that you can. I believe that a, a strong school helps to aid for a strong community. Um, I'm very um, happy to be a part of the school district and uh, very excited about the future and hope to be here for a, a very long time to come. Uh, just, I gave you a little bit of an update of kind of our first couple weeks of school. Uh, we've really had a great, great start to our school year. Uh, we have a new pr high school principal, Lisa Williams, who, who had served as the principal and is now back and we're very excited about that. Um, one thing that we are doing this year is every week we have a quote for our students and our staff. And, and our first quote for this year was make your mark. And so each of us have the responsibility, every student, every staff member, of how we're going to make our mark um, on the school community and the broader community. This week, we are, our quote is, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. <laughs> so that's, that's Dr. Seuss. I'm very excited about the facilities improvement. Again, our, our uh, including Pleasant Ridge, uh, passed a sinking fund bond not too long ago, and so you're gonna start to see major renovations as we go through. This summer, there was a lot of renovations to, to the buildings and infrastructure. We also have an energy bond that basically changes all 7,000 of our lighting fixtures to LED to make us a more efficient uh, and green uh, school community. Um, I invite you all to be a part of our homecoming on October 6th. There's a parade and tailgate at Ferndale High School. I'd love to see some of you out there. Um, also, we have various curriculum nights. We have an active Facebook page that I, that I invite you to like to keep abreast of, of what's going on in the school community. Uh, but I want to stress uh, again the fact that I'm here to work with you and to do my best to assist uh, the local government in, in any way I can. And, um, to establish a, a very strong partnership between um, the school administration and the city. So again, thank you for your time and, and I wish you a good evening. Thank you. See, the trick will be if we clap for you the second time you come. <laughs> <laughs> a lot harder. <laughs> Did anybody have any questions, comments? Thanks for coming. Well, we really welcome you and hope, hope you do stay yeah, yes, for a yes. while. I'd, I'd like every couple months to be able to kind of tell we you where so. we're at and just give you a quick update. Um, we would love that. Sounds great. Things we're doing. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the chair. Is that it? That's it? That's it. You're it? That's it? <laughs> Boy, you got, you got wow. all easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Commissioner Perry, planning DDA. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the planning commission and DDA did not meet last month, but um, our next meeting is October 23rd. Um, they are also talking about trying to have a gathering of the DDA for the holidays, just to sort of keep building community within that group along in the DDA to help them realize that they have like a, their own community and everything to help just talk about issues and ideas and everything from you know planters in the summer to holiday lights around the holidays so that's all I have thank you all right Commissioner Scott Historical Commission just a couple of quick notes. Uh, the museum will be open this weekend from 10 to noon, so please stop by and see some of the artifacts from the city. And if you've never looked at your file before, it might be interesting to see interesting details about your house. And in fact, uh, the Historical Commission would like you to put things in the file. So if you've taken a photo of your house or something, bring it over, put it in, just so that 50 years from now, the next you know person can have something to look at. And then our next meeting is on October 6th. I just wanted to ask John, do you have any more lectures coming up? No. No? Oh, that was a good one.
can we give you suggestions? We have some. Oh, okay. <laughs> Always has got a big list. Anxious to hear your suggestions. You have a big list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> I like the way he said, I'm always anxious. <laughs> All right, you got it. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Commissioner Krizyak, Recreation Commission. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we've touched on some of the items. Um, Amanda mentioned uh, the improvements that are going on at uh, Fort Ridge. Um, really excited about that. Uh, Jim had mentioned the opening for Gainesville Park to coincide with uh, the Hayride. Uh, that's coming up, always a highlight of the year. Um, pool close, we've touched on some pool issues. I know that will be a discussion at our next meeting for sure. And um, that's all I have. Okay. Is there any comments, questions? All right. Thank you. we we'll move on. Item 8, consideration of the following consent agenda. We have six items on the consent agenda. I'm looking for approval of the consent agenda. Um, Mayor, I would just ask that item 8E be removed for questioning to the end of, to the last item of business. Okay, so remove 8E to item 11, we'll make it 11A just before the city manager's report. Okay. It's okay? That's cool. I'd make a motion that we yeah. move Agenda item 8E to agenda item 11A. Okay. Is there a second? I think so we need yeah. a, a uh -huh. motion to approve the consent agenda with the removal of that. Is that yeah. what we're looking for? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. Okay. Approving the consent right. agenda with, with five own. items. Right. So, yes. I'm good with that. <laughs> I'm good with that. <laughs> I'll second that. Okay. Can we take a vote? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Foreman? Yes. Commissioner Perry? Yes. Mayor Metzger? Yes. The consent agenda with that minor change is approved. Okay, moving on to the next. Ordinance regarding DAS, small cell wireless facilities in public right of way. We have a public hearing, but I'd like Jim just to give us sure. a few words, please. Speaking of utilities, uh, one of the things that we still can regulate for now um, are telecommunications, uh, wireless telecommunications facilities. And the latest trend as um, all the networks are trying to continue to build out and as we do more and more on our phones and eat up more and more bandwidth, um, they're trying to fill in gaps and increase capacity. And um, in, in areas like Pleasant Ridge and even just kind of southeastern Oakland County in general, um, it's hard to locate a 150-foot tall monopole tower, uh, which is traditionally how they provided um, cell signals. So one of the things that the uh, networks are moving to are what they call distributed antenna systems or small uh, cell facilities. And these are small antennas that um, can co-locate on existing structures like light poles. And by putting more small uh, antenna, they can provide additional coverage. Uh, we were approached by a couple of these um, companies who wanted to co-locate here in Pleasant Ridge on some of our streetlights specifically. We told them we don't have anything to regulate this, so uh, we're going to hold off on your application until we bring this question forward. Uh, the ordinance before you sets up how we would approve these and what our expectations are for these um, types of facilities. And the, the high points are that um, first, they have to co-locate if they can, and they have to prove that it's impossible to co-locate on an existing structure or facility. If they can prove that it's impossible, that they have to put in a new tower, then uh, we can consider that, but it can't be any more than 35 feet tall. Um, the one change from when we introduced this last month is that we added in a, uh, a notification requirement. We follow the notification standards that are in the zoning ordinance, which is uh, set up by the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, anyone who lives within 300 feet of a proposed facility would get mailed notice, um, and there would be a public hearing, um, and that notice would come at least 15 days before the public hearing. So um, that is the broad stroke summary of the ordinance. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have, um, and either I or Greg can clarify anything in the ordinance. Mr. Mayor, I have a couple questions. Sure. So the notification requirement that was added, is that the, the bottom where it mentions section 82-46? Yes. Okay. 
Um, the other thing I've mentioned is that uh, we talked last month about the different spellings of co-location. I noticed there's still a couple different spellings in there. Co-location and co-location one word, so we just go through that. And then finally, my question is just what's the risk of our doing nothing with this? Because it's not allowed today. And we're not necessarily saying that we want to allow it. And the commission can deny it without any reason Correct. each time. So it's, it seems like it, you feel maybe, Greg, that we should do this just because things are moving in a certain direction and this would prepare us for something. So what are the risks of doing nothing? The risk of doing nothing is that if you have nothing in place and someone can always challenge you on the basis that you have nothing in place. Mm -hmm. and that's, <laughs> You know, that's a exclusionary zoning kind of argument in the zoning context. And I think it is safer to have something in place. This also sets forth a procedure, which we don't have now. And finally, you know, if you decide to allow one of these, it's a service for your residents because it fills in gaps for them. Um, this is not going to be probably anything that would cover the heavily trafficked roads like Woodward or 696, but it's more to, in, in many cases, these are used to enhance service in residential districts. Okay, thank you. So, Jim, I had asked a couple residents and um, some people I work with about this, and they were saying one of the benefits that we have to living in this area is that we are pretty well covered with cellular coverage and whatever whatever the coverage is called. Is it cellular coverage or what's it called? Yeah, whatever that is. So, you know, and they were saying one of the problems that they have been reading that, and, and I think this ordinance tries to address it, is that they, the, they'll make promises of like, oh, these are going to be really, you know, um, an, ele an elegant, attractive solution and that they aren't, that that isn't what they've been delivering. <laughs> And once they get up, it's really hard to get this stuff down and to back off of that stuff. So I guess that's what I want to see this ordinance help address, because I do believe what you're, what you, Greg is saying is that, you know, uh, the FCC is going to help open up some of this. And so some of this, if we're not prepared, will just happen to us. It's going to want that. So were you hearing any of this stuff, though, about it being poles and whatever that are not attractive and not, and that they can keep adding things to these poles once they put them up, too? From dealing with wireless carriers over the years. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Overpromise and under delivery is okay. kind of their... Get out of town. Yeah, but the, to answer Ann's question, the ordinance does say that they have to blend into the natural right. environment okay. as much as they can, and you can also condition your approval. Okay, so, exactly. You know, if you saw a plan and you think it needs to be modified to do exactly that, you would have the right to do that. Okay. And again, it's entirely discretionary at this time for you to allow it or not allow it. That may change, as Jim said, these yeah. laws constantly evolving, but right now this would give you the ability to regulate those aesthetic features. Okay. And the aesthetic was probably my biggest concern when Greg and I were going through the early versions of this ordinance. Thank you. So those were, I think, the bulk of the comments that I was asking Greg to uh, amend some things based purely on the aesthetic considerations. Yeah, I took notice of how you phrased those. I thought they were very well. Covered it quite well. Mayor. Yes. Just a quick question. Um, would we uh, put any um, regulation on easements and notifications and uh, and wearing of identification into this or another section of our ordinances? If we're going to do that ordinance, it would. And Greg, correct me if I'm if you disagree with this, but I believe that that ordinance would cover the people working for this ordinance. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it's the same section or a different one and if we should do that before we approve or if it's in a different section and it's okay to approve this because we're not going to modify it. Well, the difference in this case is that before anyone does anything, they have to come talk to us and get our permission. Got it. So we have leverage in this point, mm -hmm. in this case, to to guide this mm -hmm. where it should and how it should go. So yeah. that these would be are within, I'm sorry, these no. facilities are within the public right of way as well, right. so they're not going to be going into these backyards. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, just uh, so for clarification, the uh, applications will come to the full city commission that we will vote on for each application? Yes. 
And um, as far as definition of tower, um, as Commissioner Perry have referenced, uh, is there anything in the ordinance, I was looking through it, as far as distinguishing between a pole or a, t a tower, I mean, when I, when I think of a lighting pole or, um, you know, something minimal that can be added to, the, um, that's quite different than, you know, a wide base structure that tops out at 35 feet, but at its base could be quite wide. The, the ordinance never says tower, it always refers to it as pole, and mm -hmm. the, the key provision here is that, um, and I'm quoting, the maximum height of a pole or other supporting structure installed to accommodate a DAS small cell wireless network shall be 35 feet. Okay. So the height of 35 feet alone, uh, would you call 35 foot tall something a tower? I, I well, mean, you might, but that, that, that height cap in the ordinance, mm -hmm. I think, takes care of that. I guess the worrisome part for me is when it says, or other supporting structure, my reading. Well, that's, that right? it, it might not be on a pole. It might right. be mounted to a building. It might mm -hmm. be mounted to something that already exists that's mm -hmm. not a pole. So the language has to be inclusive of that. Okay. Um, if somebody comes to us and wants to build a 35 foot tall lattice structure, yes. it's like, you know, an oil <laughs> there or right. something. Yeah, that's what I was worried I'm about. I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll say thanks, but no okay. thanks to that. All right. <laughs> The ordinance does require a monocle design unless you approve something else, so that would take okay. into the, that okay. the, you know, something very wide at the time. All right. Um, just a question as far as um, have we had companies approaching us already? Yes. That's the, the one, genesis. The one that you were bringing us. How many have we had? We had two. Two? Okay. And they're waiting on approval of this? At least one of them is. Okay. I guess the only yeah. I, I the first one that came in, I asked for a lot of supplemental information and mm -hmm. they kind of went away. Okay. Maybe somewhere easier, but uh, didn't work for the second one. The second <laughs> one, they are they check in regularly on this. Okay. So yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? All right. So we are going to have a public hearing, solicitation of public comments on ordinance to amend Chapter 62, street sidewalks and other public places. By the additional, by the addition actually, of a new section, section 62-29, DAS small cell wireless facilities in the public rights of way, and ordinance 425 to amend chapter 62 street sidewalks and other public places, by the addition of a new section, section 62-29, DAS small cell wireless facilities in the public rights of way. I am opening the public hearing. Anybody who wants to comment? Don't all rush. <laughs> Looking to see none. I'll close the public hearing and move to see if we will adopt uh, the ordinance. Is there a motion to adopt? Mayor, I move that ordinance 425 amending chapter 62, streets, sidewalks, and other public places, by the additional the addition of a new section section 62-29 and DAS small cell wireless facilities in the public rights of way be adopted. Is there support? Second. Uh, any discussion? Further discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. No, I would just uh, emphasize that uh, questions of safety, questions of aesthetics um, can all be determined on a case-by-case -case basis and if there is an applicant that we feel infringes on either of those concerns, it is well within our rights to refuse okay. the application. So our residents should be aware that if they have concerns, to pay attention to the agendas. If they if they get light of an, a potential applicant um, wanting to do this in their part of town or in front of their house, um, that if they have concerns, that we need we need definitely to hear about them. Because um, that is the assurance that I have going forward so. is that if we run into an applicant and you know red flags are raised, um, not only you know we're obviously going to take that into consideration, but I think uh, residents um, definitely need to know uh, if there's an applicant on re on record will local affected uh, houses, property owners, 
be made aware of that application so they could forward their concerns to us? If we did add the 300 foot notification requirement, and again, we, that, that comes straight out of state law. Okay. It's whenever there's a conditional or special use or zoning change, there's certain things that trigger that. Mm -hmm. So this falls in. So if, you, if your property is within 300 feet of the site, the resident will get notice. Okay. And of course, we'll do all the normal things that we do whenever we get um, a special use, uh, you know, notification through other channels as well mm -hmm. um, to the broader community. But certainly, those people within 300 feet will get mailed notice. Okay. Good. Okay. That's all. Okay. Great. Um, may we take a vote, please? Commissioner Perry. Yes. Commissioner Foreman. Yes. Commissioner Cruz. Yes. Commissioner Scott. Yes. Mayor Nelson. Yes. We have adopt the ordinance is adopted. Thank you. Next item: Community Energy Management Plan adoption. Yes, Jim. Back to you. Yes, you may recall we brought this to you in June um, to introduce the draft version of the plan. Um, and then we had our community energy survey, uh, which we did immediately following that to gather um, um, input from the community on the plan and more broadly uh, input from the community on how our residents are feeling about energy reduction, um, conservation, renewable energy, um, and what they would like to do at their own homes. The community uh, energy strategic plan focuses um, on city facilities because that's what we can directly control and influence um, but the next step is once we get our own facilities uh, running more efficiently um, then how do we um, help facilitate residents who want to do these kind of similar improvements um, and actually the item that we pulled off the consent agenda is, is one of those um, one of those things um, out of that uh, energy survey, which is included in the packet, um, the results of that, uh, we found that um, broadly residents were supportive of the plan. We didn't get any comments, any substantive comments on anything that we really needed to change in the plan. So we continued working on it to refine it and put in the final detail. Um, the, the headline number is that the plan um, commits the city to reduce energy usage by 25% by the year 2020. Um, you may be familiar with such pledges um, the national level or the state level, uh, which come and go, I guess. But um, you know, those are those are typically from a 1990 or 2000 or you know some baseline kind of farther back. We couldn't do that here because, unlike at a national level, we're not measuring um, carbon generation from power plants or, or anything like that. We can only go on our own records, and we really only have good records of our energy use, um, good detailed. Um, you know, high quality records of our energy use going back to uh, the end of 2014. So we used 2015 as our baseline year, and we committed to reduce our energy usage by 25% by the year 2020. Um, we'll definitely get to that goal. And then once we do, uh, we'll continue to iterate this. We'll see what more we can do at that point, because we're, we're tackling all the low hanging fruit now. The superintendent was talking about LED lighting. You know, we've done that at the community center. All of our street lights are LED lights. All the outdoor and indoor lights are LED lights at the community center. So uh, we're starting to knock off all of those high return projects. So once we do all that, we'll see what kind of uh, reduction we've got, and then we'll you know plan round two. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, it's kind of a snowball effect as you start to save money, you have more money to invest into these projects. But the problem is the projects are costlier and have less of a payback than the original ones you did. So you have to you have to look at all of that um, together. Um, the the triple bottom line is key for us. You know, economically, environmentally, and I don't know what the other bottom line is right now. I forget, but those are the two big ones. <laughs> Close words. <laughs> so that's all I have. Um, the plan is in the uh, in your packets. If approved, we'll add it to the website under our planning documents, and uh, we'll continue to uh, go forth implementing it. Anybody have questions? Sure. No. That's okay. Then I'm going to ask for a motion to adopt the Community Energy Management Plan. May I move that the City of Pleasant Ridge Community Ener Energy Plan, Energy Management Plan, sorry, be adopted. Uh, do I have a second? I do a second. <coughs> Any further discussion? I, I would, just to say, I mean, I really like the plan. I, I also was quite interested in the in the comments and a lot of the. Mm -hmm. And what people are looking at and how, how engaged the community is around energy, um, saving energy and, and uh, you know, car our carbon footprint. So there's a lot of good ideas. It looks like a lot of people are interested in, in supporting city efforts. So uh, very happy about that. 
Can you just take a vote, please? Commissioner Foreman? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Commissioner Kuzia? Yes. Commissioner Perry? Yes. Mayor Vetsker? Yes. Motion carries. Um, next item, police pension millage update. Jim, back to you. Sure. Uh, what I want to update you on tonight is the um, the process. We, you know that we have the uh, police pension millage, which will be on the ballot in November, on November 7th. Uh, the purpose of the millage is to fund our currently uh, underfunded police pension fund. Uh, it's 48% funded right now, and uh, because MERS um, has woken up and is requiring communities to amortize their unfunded liabilities, our pension costs um, are going to go up by 200% versus the 2014 level by the mid-2020s. Um, it'll be an increase of 225 or $250,000 over what we were paying in 2014, and that's the payroll for all of our patrol officers right now. So we've got a looming and growing problem, and we've been working on it, and we've been making cuts, and we've absorbed about $90,000 of increased pension costs since 2014, or to the point where we can't really cut our way out of this problem anymore without directly impacting the services we offer to residents. So some of the, one of the things all the energy projects we've been doing um, are probably saving us thirty-five or forty thousand dollars a year. But of course, that's getting chewed up by pension costs. So we're running faster to stand still. Um, I've presented about this at numerous city commission meetings. I'm not going to do that again here tonight because. You'll see these going up in a few locations uh, around town. Uh, <laughs> enough said, right there. Our first event is going to be uh, a millage information session and a meet the candidates event um, on <laughs> Tuesday, September 26th, 2017. It's sort of an omnibus election palooza that night. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, beginning with a, a millage uh, information session at 6 o'clock. So all of our candidates can come. And we can all have the same base of information about the problem and the proposed solution. And then immediately following that at 7 o'clock will be the Meet the Candidates event where you can meet our um, extraordinarily qualified and deep pool of candidates we have for city commission this year. Um, I don't believe the mayor will be there because he's running unopposed, <laughs> but he'll be there with us in spirit. Uh, we will also have another millage information session, a second one, on Tuesday, October 17th uh, at 7 p.m. at the community center. So if you can't make it to the September 26th, we'll have another one for you to come out and, and um, hear the longer presentation on, on what's going on with the uh, police pension millage. Later this week, a postcard will be mailed to all residents, uh, providing the same information that I just told you. So this will be going to every house in town. We'll have the signs up. There are posted today. We have fact sheets and information sheets and presentations. Um, I was working on it at 6 o'clock to get them live on the website before the meeting tonight. So uh, those are all live on the, web on the website, um, right on the homepage right before you get to the boxes of information and the upcoming meeting agendas if you've used the uh, website you'll be familiar with right where they're at we took down the notification about garbage day changing and replaced it with <laughs> very good very village good. information <laughs> sheets. I think we got that then. so we've got lots of them there um, if you're looking at them and you have limited time or limited interest uh, read the executive summary and then if you really want to dive deep um, there's lots more information and detail there for you um, and a lot of the same information will be covered at the information sessions so um, depending on what kind of learner you are, we've got you covered. <laughs> um, hmm. I think that's it on the update for the uh, Middle Information Sessions. Candidates only at one, not at both? Well, Meet the Candidates is a League of Women Voters, Voters event. Thing. Oh, that? Yeah. Okay, that's same night. Right. right, so we're just, we're combining, so instead of, you know, having to come out on separate nights to hear about the Millage mm -hmm. and Meet the Candidates, you can that's leave cool. your house mm -hmm. once. And that's for more. Get all the information you need to make your informed choices on the November ballot. I'm still asking the mayor questions. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me any questions you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can face Come on. Does anybody have any questions for me about the military process? No, I, I, I did want to compliment you. I think um, I would recommend reading certainly the executive summary, but I, I find the charts and graphs. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, the, the information that you present in, in a very clear concise way points out the issue that we're facing and it's very clearly I mean you can't get around it I mean it's right there in, in, in black and white and, and you've provided plenty of the background and how we got here and and where you know what the forecast is and um, it's either 
the millage or we got to cut yeah. drastically somewhere. Yeah. Um, and nobody wants to lose police and nobody wants to lose the services that we get. So um, I think it's, I, I recommend that people do read the, the materials. I think, I think they'll, they'll see why it's so important to vote yes. Okay. I would just mention a number of years ago, remember we had the survey where things were ranked in the city mm -hmm. and our, our police department was ranked, it's very important to me and I'm willing to pay more to support mm -hmm. it. That's right. Yeah. So this is the time where we'll see how that comes through. And I think it'll be just as we saw in the survey. I do too. Hope so. I do too. One resident, one longtime resident came up to me and said, of course we vote for that. We promised them. That was a promise we that's made. Right. We we owe it to them. So mm -hmm. I think that's what where people will. And, and that's a key point. I'll say it, I said I wasn't going to talk about what we talked about before, but that is a key point. This is this millage is about living up to the promises we've made mm -hmm. to the police who were who were, who were retired, right. who are still here, right. who we hired in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have made all of the changes necessary uh, since 2011. The the pension fund that's in trouble is for officers hired before 2011. The pension funds we've created for officers hired after 2011 are all fully funded, fully funded. Mm -hmm. and there are you know no issues with those. We're going to be fine. It's just a matter of you know it's the boa constrictor that ate the pig, and it's, we just have to pass that through the system. And then mm -hmm. once that happens, then we're, then we're good. No, it's we'll be fine. <laughs> 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 all right. Very cramped. <laughs> You're a visual <laughs> there is there is that picture on page eleven of his one of his handouts from the Python, the boa constrictor eating the pig. You know, not and not everything's a home run. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, good good try. All right, very memorable. Any other? Okay. Now we will go to 11A, which was the item resolution regarding Semrio Aggregate Solar Purchasing Initiative Participation. Jim, you want to? Sure. This, this is actually one of the things that came out of the uh, survey was a, a recurring comment that, you know, if the city could somehow offer a way for residents to uh, save money on installing solar panels through an aggregate, you know, aggregating a number of jobs so you might get better pricing. And um, I think that was a comment that uh, the, um, the group we were working with on the grant that funded the energy plan, there was a number of communities that these energy plans were done for, Ferndale, Dearborn, um, Wayne, us, and uh, maybe Ann Arbor. But uh, I think a comment that they heard recurringly was this idea of aggregating solar purchasing. So um, Semrio, uh, who's the... Um, umbrella organization for the street lighting coalition we were part of for the energy management grant. Um, they partnered up with Michigan Solar Solutions and uh, McNaughton McKay. Michigan Solar Solutions is an installer and McNaughton McKay is a supplier, really the supplier for a lot of electrical equipment, but specifically a lot of the solar um, panels. So they uh, teamed up with those two contractors to provide a turnkey solution for residents who are looking to go solar. Um, financing, installation, sourcing of the uh, material, all of it. So um, this is the program that we uh, it, that is um, proposed before you that we join. There's no commitment, there's no cost to the city, there's no financial benefit to the city from this either. It's merely a service that we would be offering. Um, our only commitment is to publicize it, make our residents aware that it exists. Uh, there's nothing that says that we're granting some kind of exclusive uh, right for this company to do solar installations in Pleasant Ridge. Any resident can call anyone they want to to install solar panels. Um, we're just, this is a turnkey uh, program that uh, Semrio has put together. Um, it'll be up to residents to you know, do their due diligence if they want to take uh, part in this. But again, um, the concept that a lot of residents asked for is what this is. So. Um, that's the background on, on what's proposed before you. Um, I know that Commissioner Kurziak had a, a question today. I don't know if you want to do that. Yeah, uh, and I appreciate taking the time to explain that to uh, our residents. The concern I had and the question I had was that uh, setting this up, uh, I think, will be a, a great benefit to our residents. It's a turnkey package um, that I think most residents, if they're interested, and I, we referenced the survey earlier, uh, there was some uh, conversation about uh, how many residents in the community are really ready to take this step. 
I think as uh, programs like this are brought to their attention, pricing continues to um, become more achievable for some residents. We're going to see more people interested in this. Um, so the whole idea and the effort that SEM Rio has put into it is something that I support. Um, <laughs> what stopped me and what prompted uh, my questions was that in the resolution, not only does it approve the setup of this program, but it commits Pleasant Ridge to promoting, I think they used the word endorsing even, um, this program, uh, which uh, I don't want to prejudice any residents against investigating this program. In fact, uh, I would like to direct their attention to it. The concern that I had was when it calls out the contractor, specifically uh, the installers, uh, Michigan Solar Solutions of Commerce Township. Uh, the question I had for Jim earlier today and was something that I asked to be uh, discussed at the meeting this evening was that um, there are a lot of electricians throughout the state who are working on projects like this. And one thing that I have hope for um, from an employment perspective throughout the state is that as we turn to some of these uh, new energy projects, that these will provide uh, stable middle class jobs for more and more uh, people who live in the state of Michigan. Uh, a project like this, a commitment like this, is one of those projects. So I just had a, a, a concern about uh, the labor standards that were going to be connected, and specifically Michigan Solar Solutions as being the contractor who's called out here. I, I, and the mayor mentioned it earlier, and we had this discussion about contractors going into people's yards and people working minimum wage, yep. unskilled. Um, I don't believe that is the future we should be promoting as far as some these new energy jobs. We should be promoting a future that um, coincidentally is providing a path and a secure middle income, a middle class lifestyle for people who are working on these projects. Um, so that was my concern about Michigan Solar Solutions. I sent an email earlier today to Jim and Jim did the legwork as always and, and got me an answer as far as um, this particular contractor will not be using union labor or IBW electricians, which I would have preferred they do, but um, Jim has assured me that they will be, uh, that they do use prevailing wage uh, guidelines as part of their employment structure. And by law, and anybody here can correct me, um, Mr. Need, uh, specifically, but my understanding is that the way the prevailing wage is set in the law in the state of Michigan right now is that it does work off a summary of uh, collectively bargained agreements in the industry. So Jim provided me that information. Uh, that was my concern and it was something I did want to speak to because I do feel it is important going forward that as we embrace this, these new technologies that we also look on um, the opportunities that they provide as far as uh, jobs and a standard of living for people in Pleasant Ridge, people throughout the state. So that was why I had asked that that be removed. I feel comfortable that um, my concerns were addressed and if nobody else has any questions, I'll just make the motion. I'd like to make a motion that the resolution regarding SEM Rio Aggregate Solar Purchasing Initiative participation be approved. A second. Any discussion? Okay, Amy? Commissioner Krizak? Yes. Commissioner Perry? Yes. Commissioner Foreman? Yes. Commissioner Scott? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jason. Very good. Motion carries. Um, now, I don't know why, but we move to the city manager's report. <laughs> oh, I You got more? Here we are. All right. Uh, I have a, uh, a slideshow I'd like to go through, oh. but it's a lot of good, maybe one disappointing thing. Yeah, that is stuff. Uh, 
this is actually an example of what the small cell or uh, and an installed example looks like. Uh, just to double back, you can see the little tiny blade yeah. on top, which is the end tap. And then this is the equipment that goes on the pole. So that's that's something that's not great, but you know, it's um it's something. That's the starting point for what we're dealing with. Not as bad as the cable equipment. Yeah, right. Uh, this is the roof of our community center. So we are now generating our own electricity. Uh, I think we've generated 1.4 megawatts of power since this went live on uh, August 29th. So that's a cool thing. Um, we're excited to get this done and going. Uh, talking about rooftop solar, we just approved uh, participation in the Sembrio program. One of the things we need to look at is our regulatory environment. Um, and you've heard me talk about this, I think, at some other meetings. Uh, the Planning Commission is looking at our solar power and our solar panel uh, regulations for residential houses. Right now, you can't have a solar energy system where it's visible from the street. That's our standard. In Pleasant Ridge, that's a tough standard because our streets run east and west. So your south-facing facade is your energy-generating facade. So if you're going to be able to do a solar system, a solar energy system, <laughs> Sorry. Pluto orbiting your house, probably. <laughs> if you're going to do a solar energy system, uh, and you're on the north side of one of those east-west streets, you need to you need to use the street-facing facade for your house. So our, our regulations right now preclude a little bit short of half of our residents from even considering using or installing solar energy. Um, we're a heavily treed community, so that's a challenge. But then our regulatory environment is also another one for those um, residents who live on the north side of an east-west street. So please, take our solar energy survey. Uh, we're soliciting comment from the community right now. Uh, we're going to be sending this out in an e-blast. Uh, we just posted it on Facebook. Um, and we have about 55 responses so far to it. We're, we're trying to get more about whether we should allow solar panels that, that are visible from the street. And if we do, should there be some kind of uh, design restriction on those? Um, you can get solar panels that are all black. Um, on these, you can see where the, the, the grid on them is the metallic looking material and the surface of the panels is actually black. You can get solar plant panels where the, um, the grid part is all black as well. So it gives it just a cleaner look. And even if your roof isn't black, it's a little bit less noticeable um, on the roof. And we can require that, certainly, for any panel that's street facing. Uh, it doesn't add a lot of cost. Uh, the Planning Commission will be uh, looking at the results of the survey at their October 24 meeting and then figuring out how to go forward with this, uh, whether or not we want to uh, keep the standards we have in place or to go with uh, new standards. And I'll, I'll give you a hint. So far, it's about two-thirds are in favor of allowing these where they'd be visible from the street, and about one-third of our respondents so far say, no, the um, aesthetic design considerations are more important than allowing solar panels. Um, and that's a very valid point. I mean, we're a, a city that the entire city is a historic district, so we need to we need to hash through this question. Um, one thing that we do see a lot of is uh, Tesla's solar shingles are going to be the answer <laughs> to all of this, and they may be. But if you look at the prices for that right now, Tesla goes through a lot of uh, mathematical gymnastics to get to the point where they show that their roof has a payback. Um, they add in the cost of replacing your roof into the cost of putting in the solar sure. panels on your house. And I price it out for my house, and the Tesla website told me it was going to be uh, $52,000 <laughs> to put this Tesla solar roof on my house, and then it would never pay back. Mm -hmm. But the cost of putting a conventional solar panel system on my house, there would be the same um, uh, power generating as the Tesla system, well, a conventional solar system is about three dollars a watt now for a residential install. So, a five megawatt or five uh, kilowatt hour system for a typical residential house is plenty. So that's about fifteen thousand dollars. So, mm -hmm. Tesla's solar roof is not going to change or save the world or be our, um, you know, silver bullet that allows us to have pretty solar. It's got a ways to go. So. Um, the idea that we should wait for technologies to mature before we do anything, I don't know if we have time, quite frankly, for that, if we should you know, stand away or if we should allow what's good now and then change that later when other technologies mature. That's certainly a valid way forward as well. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox on that. Please go take the survey. Uh, we'll add a link to this on the city website as well, and uh, expect to see this in an e-blast soon. 
Um, other updates, uh, Lake Gainsboro, uh, which was <laughs> warming at the playground uh, when we had heavy rain events, um, I think has been, uh, from what we can see, um, mitigated. The two inch rainfall we had a few weeks ago that flooded basements in Berkeley mm -hmm. um, created Lake Gainsboro again, but this time we got rid of it within probably six hours and it was nice. gone. Excellent. Um, one of the things we wanted to do at the park coming out of 2014 in the uh, basement event we had from the um, six inches of rain we got in August three years ago, we knew we, we have to start addressing rainwater better. Um, we have a 100-year-old storm sewer system here that was a combined sewer system that was put in the ground at a time when everything went in the ground and it went really fast into a pipe straight out into a river or a waterway somewhere. And we said, well, that's not a great idea. So then um, the overflow facility, the coon facility was put in to treat the water and hold the water. The problem is during the really big rain events that we get now that weren't, that we didn't get in 1961 when the system was designed and the rain event was a 10 year uh, storm from 1961 and now we're getting 100 and 500 year storms every two or three years. We basically, our sewer system is like a bathtub that the drain is plugged because the Coon facility only can take so much and then it fills up and then everything starts going back. So we're in a completely different kind of environment right now than we were when the system was designed. So we have to change, we have to accommodate this. With the park, the idea was to take all the water from the park and put it back in the ground and try to not put it into the sewer system to start to reduce the amount of water we put into the sewer system so that we don't get these events over time recurring. And you know, one of the things that we found was that it wasn't functioning exactly as we had hoped. Two things I think helped with this. One is you grow grass, it holds more of the water in place instead of it all running to the low point here. But then we installed dry wells that just get the water into the ground faster so that it can absorb in. And um, this is the area where those are. You can see here and here, if you go out there and look, there's two green grates that are there now. Those are uh, the, infl the inlet points and there's a drain tile system that we went around the corner. Um, that catches that water, puts it in the ground. So hopefully we'll be getting rid of this a lot faster. Um, the pond we get out there is to some extent a feature and not a bug. Um, and it's just one of those things that, you know, I think we need to start to accept and think about rainwater a little differently. Um, and it'll hopefully be a very short term thing now for us. The um, infiltration area at the end of Kensington, we also did the rain garden and that dissipated much quicker as well. That's great. I think you'll see that at the end of Kensington, we don't get the big Lake Kensington by the drain inlets mm -hmm. to the extent we used to. So putting it in the ground is, is taking some of the pressure off the sewer system there. I think it's having um, noticeable effects. So we'll continue to monitor this, make sure it works the way it should. You may have noticed at the end of Maywood at Flynn Field, we uh, were having a digging project. We uncovered something last year during the Gainsborough construction project when a big piece of equipment drove over a steel plate that we had no idea was there and smashed it and we found that we had an issue and we didn't know what it was so we had them cover it back over with the steel plate and said okay. This spring we had a lot of flooding in the Flynn, in Flynn Field, I mean it was kind of deep there. Um, we had a lot of rain for a very short period of time. So we got to thinking, we, always heard, we had always heard that, that the old DPW, and this is going back before, uh, when, when we had our own DPW in Pleasant Ridge, before really any of us who were here were here, uh, working at the city, um, had put in a French drain system to drain mm -hmm. that field. And uh, so he said, oh, well, you know what, maybe they crushed, or maybe this was the tie-in where it went to the sewer, so we dug it up to see what it was. Turns out it's an old oil water separator or an old septic that had been cut off. Uh, you can see the old inlet pipe where yeah. something flushed into this. Mm. So this is a remnant from before time. <laughs> Wasn't related to the French drain system, at least now we know what it is. Um, so that's what the big dirt pile is at Gainesville Park. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, a little amateur archaeology. <laughs> we didn't find anything interesting, unfortunately. <laughs> but at least now we know. <laughs> we still don't know why the field flooded at Flint Field, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, the bad news, oh. the giant 41 inch maple tree in Stevenson Park, um, that you don't really notice this when you're in Stevenson Park, but you notice it when you're on Sylvan and you notice it when you're across the street on Woodward. You can see dead, 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 oh. dead. And you can see the color of the tree yeah. compared to you know everything else. It's got that kind of sickly yellow. The tree is it's gone. It's got hangers. We've been pulling hangers out of it. It's dropping a lot of branches. It's big. So I just wanted to give everyone 
ample heads up and uh, pre-notice that the tree so nice. is dead, that we're not tree-hating evil people in Pleasant Ridge for cutting it down. <laughs> we have to cut it down. Um, and in fact, we've known about this for a couple of years and just have been watching it deteriorate. We hung on for as long as we could. Part of the reason why there's five pretty new trees planted along Woodward um, mm -hmm. to compensate for that sure. over time. Um, these are um, London plane trees. So those will be nice, big, substantial, interesting trees uh, that will reforest that over time. But um, this is a heads up that that will be coming in the next month or so. Um, we've been going through and getting all of our tree work ready for this year to do this fall. So you'll be seeing a lot of tree work happening. Um, Amanda talked about this, the uh, uh, largely foundation sponsored project. Uh, this is behind the community center. It looks a little different now. Um, all the play structure, the play structure is gone. Uh, the balance beam is gone, the uh, plate, uh, the swing set is gone, the uh, um, sandbox is gone. So we are prepped and ready to go. Um, work will be starting this week on the patio project back there. And uh, all, uh, all signs indicate that the foundation will have a lovely patio to do their um, <laughs> event on, on October 18th. Yay. And if not, then, oh boy, I don't know. I don't want to think about that. We'll have Something's gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing is, um, this is just uh, a, a shot of Hanover before, and then at the same oh, spot, spot nice. after. Nice. So you can see what a difference a street makes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a winner. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy to say that we're approaching very glacially the end of this project. We've been at about 95% complete for a while. And, trying to get contractors to get back out here to get their subs out. It's hard to find good sub subcontractors these days, I think, because <laughs> that's been a struggle, I'll admit, on Hanover as well. Um, but there we are. The end. Okay. Beautiful. Any uh, questions or comments for Jim? Sure. Uh, sad to hear about the tree. I mean, and I wasn't going to mention it, but as I was walking in, and I want to, like, hopefully there's something reassuring, but uh, our Christmas tree looks a little That has looked a little, a little sickly for a few years, too. Yeah, I don't know if we have or we should kind of put that on some sort of watch or... We're monitoring it. <laughs> All right, because that would be... I mean, this will be, this will be devastating um, oh, no. if we were to lose that. Well, I mean, the good thing is we've got other large trees that can take its place <laughs> okay. close by. <laughs> we've got contingency, Christmas okay. contingency plans. Holiday right. plans yeah, we'll, in place. We'll hold your hands for a couple of No, that'd be, it'll be tough. <laughs> it'll be tough. The good thing is, is it's looked that way, but it hasn't really progressed. So okay. we've kind of been in yeah, this, you know, this sort of arrested easy. decline for a while. So you can paint the Okay. Yeah. Spray. 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 Yeah. yeah, spray paint. We do that in the apprentices yeah. where we spray them. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else? All right. Let's move to other business. Who wants to start? Go for it. Okay. Um, book club. Kathy Gillis was here earlier. She was so excited to give me this book. Uh, she gave it to me a year ago, and then the book club decided that they wanted to read it. Uh, I finally had the chance over the last month to read it. Uh, it's called The Boys in the Boat. It's an account of the 1936 Washington crew team. Normally a subject I wouldn't have that much interest in, but I have to say, going through this book, um, it was fabulous. It takes uh, an account of these young men and their journey to Berlin, the same uh, Olympics that uh, you know Jesse Owens made uh, history, uh, obviously with the rise of, of Hitler in Germany, it was a very important um, set up for uh, the tragedy that was to uh, befall the world uh, in coming years. But um, fabulous book. We will be discussing it tomorrow at 7 o'clock at the community center, Wednesday, September 13th at 7 p.m. And um, John Wright is here, read the book, brought it to our attention that there was a uh, PBS documentary on these uh, eight boys who brought home the gold medal in 1936. It's about a, an hour long. So we thought tomorrow that we'll incorporate the viewing of the um, boys of 36 with the discussion of the boys in the boat 
and uh, it should be uh, it should be pretty rewarding. I know uh, you know John. I think enjoyed the book, and there'll be much to talk about tomorrow um, as far as that. The October book is the Little Paris Bookshop, a book of which I know nothing about. Um, but I have two copies. Actually, I have more than two copies. But if anybody needs a copy, please contact me. I can get you uh, a borrowed book for the month. Uh, and we'll be discussing that book Wednesday, October 11th, 7 p.m. at the rec at the rec center as well. So, um, and then uh, so that's the two book club events. And then um, I also wanted to mention. I know the City Commission in March approved a resolution supporting uh, an organization called Welcoming Cities, and as part of that resolution we talked about different things that um, the City of Pleasant Ridge could do in the spirit of inclusion and um, welcoming uh, not only new residents but um, just visitors and, and people to our city. Uh, so there's been some banter back and forth. We really haven't really set a direction on the, that yet, but there is uh, a thought that next week, a week from tonight, Tuesday the 19th of September, at the Recreation Center at 7 o'clock, um, we could have like a little informal uh, round table type discussion uh, open to all residents. And uh, so we could talk about some of the issues surrounding inclusion in the state, in the state of Michigan, in the city of Pleasant Ridge particularly, and things that we would like to do as a community over the coming year to sig signal our support for um, those ideals that we approved as part of the Welcoming Cities uh, Coalition. So I know I've talked to the neighbor, shared, you know, the city commission is aware. Um, just want to extend an invitation to all residents that next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, I think we'll bring some desserts, maybe some cookies, maybe a pie or something. Yeah. Um, and we'll just talk about um, the issues surrounding inclusion and then um, what we can do uh, to stage events. And, and also, the mayor's talked about just an opportunity to welcome new residents. Yes. If, if there's um, residents who are looking for uh, ways to get involved in the city or, or to meet their neighbors, it would also be a good opportunity for that. So It's kind of the broader welcoming. Right. Granted, you can be welcomed to the foundation in, in October, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. It's, it's a lot of welcoming. Right. Next week, is, welcoming. next week is welcoming week nationally. <laughs> <laughs> and so we wanted to at least have some kind of event, and, and granted, we're still, you know, fumbling as as, as Jason yeah. said, trying to figure out where we're going with this. But just to get a, have a get together and start talking about what we could do for the year coming, you know, events that we could hold mm -hmm. for the coming year, um, the kinds of activities that we might want to hold. So, um, yeah, it's going to be very informal, but we hope uh, we'll get something out quickly so that people at least have some. Uh, notification, but we hope that people will just come. I yeah. mean, it, and it'll just be very, you know, come and meet your neighbors, come and talk about welcoming issues, um, mm -hmm. and we'll see you next yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. And that's all I have, Mary. Right? Um, I have one thing, just just as an aside, and it's um, I'm sure that everybody is thrilled by their uh, soccer bins. Yes. And everybody's recycling like mad. Um, I know Jim had had some discussions with uh, the city manager in Huntington Woods previously about maybe a contest. Yeah. No. I, was, I was approached a couple days ago by a commissioner from Royal Oak who was talking about communities that had just gotten bins. Huntington Woods has had their bins for a while. Royal Oak just got bins. Hazel Park just got bins, I think. Oak Park just got bins. And he was thinking about some kind of contest as well. Get get the where we were previous to bin arrival, and at some point in the near future, 
start to do what kinds of percentage increase, try to have a contest mm -hmm. to see who's increasing. Same thing that Huntington Woods was talking about. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, because we were really high rate. I mean, we've won state awards for our recycling with the little bins. Mm -hmm. oh. so we don't have as much headroom as Royal Oak maybe does, so we got to be careful about how we set this up. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we will discuss. I appreciate that. We will discuss. I'm not, I'm not, I didn't uh, I just, say we're I don't, don't want to set ourselves up for failure here. <laughs> no, no. Huntington <laughs> Woods is the 27 Yankees of recycling, yeah, right. and I mean, we're kind of close behind uh, whoever's not the 27 Yankees, but also a good baseball team. That's us. Could be the Cleveland Indians. That's right. 84 Tigers. Yeah. Yeah. 84. Right. We're the 84 Tigers yeah, 84 of recycling tigers. at this point. Thank you. And so, yeah. Well, well he started talking teams. about we have the loser would wear a Royal Oak T-shirt and some other stuff, and I don't want to go. I don't want to go there. So I still think, would, I still so think I'm not you know what? I still think we, we gun for the best. We go for Huntington Woods. Okay. All right. Let's, let's All right. talk about. Well, that. now it's an even playing field, right? It's well, never been even try. before. That's right. That's right. So we exactly. knock. Yeah. So we knock up Huntington Woods, and then we go. Right. <laughs> and, and then we drop the mic. Regular run anymore. All right. Manhattan and Something. Something to think about. All right. So just so don't recycle until the contest starts. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it in your garage, wherever it is. Okay. Any other issues? Mayor, I have one. Comments? Uh, people speaking of welcoming, you welcome. this is along those lines. Uh, we did a new residence event, what a year or so ago, and it was very well received mm -hmm. by all the groups that participated. Just wondering if that's something we can look at doing again. I know that needs more planning than right, something right, like exactly, this does, yeah, but maybe over the winter when things are not so busy, we could do something similar. Would like to do that. Yeah. We should probably do it every, you know, so whatever. So we have all the ta years. tables for all the different yeah. groups and the, and the commissions and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, we'd like to do that. Cool. Yeah. Proper time. Come on. Mm -hmm. and it would have been nice to have had that as part of this, but yeah, <laughs> timing. All right. Um, Anything else? Oh, Amy? Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. sorry. I know, you're sitting there. <laughs> I wasn't going to go pay for gas. Yeah, that's all right. Um, applications for absentee ballots are on the website, so if you'd like an absentee ballot, grab the application off the website or stop in at City Hall, give me a call, I can get you the application, and uh, the ballot should be here uh, September 23rd and it will get mailed out. The closer registration for the November election is October 10th. It's at 5 o'clock. Um, there's several different areas that you can register to vote, Secretary of State being one of them, my office being another one. Mm -hmm. So if, if you need to register, stop in and get you registered. And we have new election equipment mm -hmm. that was just delivered in the last two weeks. Similar to the old equipment, it's still optical scan. You're still going to fill in the little, it's a square, not an oval. Oh. Um, it's a little higher speed. I don't know. We had pretty good speed on the other yeah. one. Uh, less jamming. They were doing some training. We'll be training the election inspectors probably next month on the equipment. So um, what I'm planning on doing is having one set up at the rec center. You kind of see it. Okay. They're really compact. Yeah. They're really mm -hmm. small. Mm -hmm. um, so they will be in use for the November election. Excellent. Oh, cool. Good. I mean, what happens to the equipment when it's not in use? Store it. Yeah, we store it. We have a closet that we store all the election equipment over at the community center. And they're in locked cases, so we can get to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's <laughs> master, you know? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little tiny brushes that you can do. That's it. Thank That's you. Okay. Is there anything else? Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>